All right, so when we're rounding, oftentimes you're going to be seeing it like this in terms of round to the first decimal, the second decimal. Here I just use a simple number of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Of course, it's still going to work even if we go with a bunch of random decimals, a bunch of random numbers in each of those places. The first decimal is still the first number after the decimal. The second decimal is still the second number after the decimal place. Even if there's nothing to the left of the decimal like this, it still works the same way. You'll also see it instead of saying first decimal, it'll say round to one decimal place. Or instead of round to the third decimal, it'll say round to three decimal places. But notice those ideas are interchangeable. So then we can see it where whatever that first number is after the decimal place, that's one decimal. Whatever the second number is after the decimal, that's the second. We're going to apply that with a few examples, because examples work well for working out the kinks. Please write down this number on your paper. 98.784913 and we're going to see how we use those rounding rules. So the first thing we need to do is figure out, okay, when it says round to the second decimal place, what is it actually talking about here? And so the second decimal place, notice that's this number here. It's where that 8 is. And so that's the only number I'm really interested in at the moment. Now when we round to it, it's kind of like just taking an X to that number and cutting off everything after it. There's just one little detail. We don't just cut off everything after the 8. We do have to make a decision here. We need to decide, is this going to stay 78 or is it going to become 79? Those are the only two options. It cannot stay, I'm sorry, it cannot go down to like 77. It's not going to go up to 80. It's either 78 or 79. All right? Now, what tells us that is the one next number. I don't care about any of these other numbers out here. I only care about that one next number. So based on that, are we going to have to change it to a 79? No, it's going to stay 78. Why? Because this number here, this 4 here, is under 5. If that number is 0 through 4, it means leave it the same. And so it becomes 0.78. Okay. We're going to do a few more examples like this. Each one's going to get a little faster. Write down this number, please. All right, so the first thing we do is we figure out where that fourth decimal place is. So if I'm going to round this to four decimal places, that means down to where that eight is. So that's my dividing line. I now look at the one next digit. I don't care about anything else. I only care about the one next digit, so that can be ignored. I care about that three. Does that three tell me to round it up or leave it alone? It says leave it alone. Yep. Because that number right after what we're rounding to, so that first number that's out here after that line, it's under 5. So it's between 0 and 4. If that's the case, it stays this. Our final answer here, 7.1258. One of the reasons why we take this time at the start on rounding is because you're going to be doing these problems later, and you're going to be doing complex algebra, and it's really frustrating when you do a big complex algebraic problem, and then you miss it because you didn't round it right. So we got to make sure we get this down so that you'll be ready for the tougher stuff. All right, next problem. Please write down this number. All right, so for this one, we're rounding to the third decimal. And again, remember, when I say to the third decimal place, that means to the third digit that follows the decimal. So I'm basically starting at my decimal and counting one, two, three. That's how many I want. All right, so I now need to look at the one next digit. Remember, I do not care about the nine or the one here. I only care about the one next digit. That's an eight this time. So the three is going to stay a three 
Or does it round up to four? It rounds up to four, absolutely. Because what we're really doing here is we're saying, this here tells me that this is really going to be closer to 474 than it is to 473. That one next makes all the difference in the world. So that's going to be 0.474. So this is the last one we're looking at together before you go and practice it on your own. We first identify where the two decimal places are. And so then, that tells me I'm rounding to where the 4 is. So I cut off after that. And I look at the one next digit, so that tells me where the 6 is. Remember, I don't care about anything else. I only care about the one next digit. So, is this closer to 34 or 35? It's closer to 35, yeah. Because... This number here, it is between 5 and 9. If that number is between 5 and 9, that tells you go ahead and round it up. The idea of the parent function actually is one of the most significant ones you're going to see because the parent functions basically are the fundamental building blocks that let you do all of the types of graphs like the ones that you've been learning to do today. So here's an example of one. You can see the graph here. This looks like a familiar shape with the stuff we've been doing earlier today, right? If it doesn't, check those sheets of notes that I gave you. Find the shape that looks the same. What I want to know is what is the parent function for this graph. Now the parent function, remember, is the simplest form of the equation. What is the simplest equation I can write that gives us this shape? So since every single equation that gives us this shape has an x squared in it, our parent function is going to be, got to restart that, there we go, is going to be f of x equals x squared. Now again, I'm using function notation for this, but you don't have to use function notation to write the parent function. So you could also have written it as what? What's the same as f of x? y is. Yeah. So you also could have written it as y equals x squared. You just want to start getting in the habit of seeing f of x as well as y really meaning the same things. So this is the parent function. Anything with addition or subtraction or any of that stuff in it, that's not the parent function, because the parent function is this one. It is the simplest version. Let's check and see how well you're doing on the other one. For this graph, the straight V, what is the parent function for all of the graphs that are this straight V shape? Well, you see it there in your notes, right? It's these bars around it. We'll do f of x equals, and then we've got these bars around x. How do we read that with those bars in there? Yeah, absolute value. That is called the absolute value of x. Now, y'all remember what absolute value does? It might have been a long time, so let's refresh your memory if you don't remember. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples for it. Uh, the absolute value of 3 is what? So the absolute value of 3 is 3. What is the absolute value of negative 5? 5, absolutely. Because the absolute value, it makes it positive. That's what it does. And that's why our graph looks this way. Because like the absolute value of 3 was 3, the absolute value of negative 5 was a positive 5. That's why it bounces back up, because it's making whatever it was positive. Our y values can never go negative as a result. Let's go through the other two real quick here. So for this graph, what is the parent function? So it ends up giving us either y equals x or f of x equals x. So it's just equal to x for the line parent function. 
This is the linear family. Now, linear is the name, f of x equals x is the parent function. So just a little distinction there. All right, and our last one. What gives us this shape of graph? Again, we look through our notes, we find the one that has this shape, and the equation is, yep, this is the square root of x. And again, you can do y equals, or you can do f of x equals. Either way is perfectly fine. The big thing is I need you to be aware that they're interchangeable. I could write it that way, or I could write it this way, and both graphs look and mean the exact same thing. Now, why am I talking about this parent function stuff? How does knowing what the parent function looks like help you? How is it helpful to know this from memory? By knowing the parent function, you can actually graph this function. Here we have f of x equals the absolute value of x minus 4 plus 7. Okay, so let's say you're going and graphing this. What does the minus 4 do to your graph. That x minus 4, the minus 4, moves it to the right by 4. You can see the examples on your sheet there. And one of the things I want you to note here is that minus 4 actually moves it to the right. Your intuition might tell you to the left because it's minus, but strangely, for whatever reason, whenever we go left and right, Minus is going to move it right. If this was a plus instead, it would have moved it to the left. All right. Now then, on to the other part here. What about that plus 7? What does the plus 7 do to our graph? Which way does it move it? Because all these are moving them. Exactly, yes. It moves it up 7. So... I know my graph goes right 4 and up 7, so when I have my graphing grid, the first thing I do is I go right 4, and then I go up 7, and I plot my first point there. And then, why do I need to know the parent function? Because once I know where that first point goes, I can draw the whole graph, just because every absolute value graph is that V shape. And so once I know where that first point goes, I can draw the V. The same V I draw from any of the other points, it's just a matter of knowing where I start it from. That's the big concept of the parent function. And when you get to know each of these four, everything's going to get to be a lot easier as a result. Let's practice that with f of x equals x squared plus 5. What does the plus 5 do to the graph? Yeah, this plus 5, it's going to move it up 5. Now, how do we know that? Because, you know, how do you tell whether that's going to be going up and down or if it's going to be going left and right? What told us that it was going up and down is the fact that it was not in the parentheses. In your examples, you'll notice that any time it went left and right, it was parentheses, x plus or minus something. That tells us left, right. The plus 5 hang on the end on every single one of these equations, whether it was quadratic or absolute value or a line or if it was square root, every time there was a number hanging on the end, it moved it up and down. And plus moves it up. And so I would graph this by moving it up 5, put my first point there, and then what's the shape of a x squared graph? Once you know what the shape is, you make that shape. x squared is that u-shaped graph. 